Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Dawn of War Soulstorm. Let's get into the Chaos Stronghold. Little was ever uncovered, and little will ever be known of how the Warp Storm was unleashed on the Karava system's fourth habitable planet. Whether the guardsmen there grew corrupt and turned to evil worship, or whether the storm took them unawares is an open question. What is without doubt is that at the storm's eye lay the lair of the Chaos Space Marines. And at the heart of this lair, a network of unholy and blood-stained shrines linked somehow inextricably to the storm itself. Although the lethal warp storm would flicker and squall here and there, ever shifting, a permanent conduit to the warp was maintained between these shrines. A charged field of immateria whirled there, certain death to any who had not given themselves over fully to chaos. In that radiant deadly energy field, Strange shapes could be seen dancing, screaming, howling. Any would-be conqueror of this unholy citadel would somehow have to dispel the chaos field that protected it. To enter it would be certain death. And while it stood, nothing could reach the forces of chaos that lurked at its center. They come! They come! Yes! We feel them! They approach! Their blood shall flow at our feet! Blood for the Blood God! Yes! We shall slake our thirst for death! For chaos! For death! Yes! They draw near. Let them come. The very ground will poison you. Demons will appear from the warp when your back is turned. And we shall lash out from every direction, and yours shall be the cries of death and horror. <laughs> The sound of your doom will ring in your skull, in your soul. You shall tremble, and your blood shall be a gift to the blood god. Let them oh, come. damn it, I cut the end of that. Anyway, uh, you may notice I jumped in a little bit, 14 minutes in. Um, <laughs> this is the base setup. Uh, I mainly skipped because this map has an annoying gimmick. Well, it's not only the gimmick's fault. The gimmick is you can't destroy the main Chaos base until you've destroyed all their Chaos statues around the map. The problem is the Chaos's main base is literally up the hill where, like, my units are. It is literally up there. That is... And annoyingly, that is a fully-fledged Chaos base. They will just constantly, well, do AI things, teleport in fully upgraded units, and throw them at you. Which is annoying. Very annoying. Um, which is, funny enough, the reason why this, this level specifically, I'll be jumping around a lot. Because this took me... nearly like an hour and a half something like that to beat because a ton of that is just running around destroying um chaos attack waves and losing entire attack waves to quite well fought out assaults also i did waste a ton of time building the aircraft of the space marines because i realized these things are aircraft um they're still land speeders they're labeled as land speeders uh, so I thought they'd be good. I mean, they are good. It's just 
they're not as good as the they're not as tanky as the rest of the Space Marine vehicles. So they're not as useful. Also, I never deal with the defilers because the defilers aren't the problem. Gathering intelligence. <laughs> the problem, funny enough, is the uh, is the predators. Now, what am I going to talk about for roughly like 50 minutes, something like that? <laughs> One of their I've got a couple of stuff. I thought I would go back to my favourite topic, which is the Chaos Forces of uh, 40k, of which there's, there's a surprisingly large amount. Now, I've covered, well, I haven't covered the Primarchs. I, may, I might cover the Primarchs um, if I start running out of time, but I was going to cover their lieutenants as... Their lieutenants are actually quite interesting for a lot of the, a lot of the um, a lot of the legion. Also, yeah, whenever, funnily enough, the chaos lord doesn't talk that much, but it's mainly just a lot of filibustering about how if you destroy his shrines, he'll kill you, or insulting his own men because they let you destroy another shrine. It, it's not that impressive. Anyway, um. The, the four lieutenants I'll be talking about are to do with the four lieutenants of, Do of the Dawn of War series. So it sticks, you know, so it's in, in line with what's going on. As, weirdly, we've had quite a lot of Chaos Legion show up in the Dawn of War series. So, the base game, you had Bale and Sindri, who were Alpha Legion. Then you had, the, you had, um, Lord, uh, Krull who was word eater, world eaters. Then you had Eliphas, different Eliphas to the actual one in canon, as there is another famous Eliphas, uh, who was a word bearer. Uh, you had his weird lieutenant in the Eldar stronghold, who I forget if he got a name, who was Night Lords. And then you have this guy, who I don't know his name <laughs> off the top of my head, who is another Alpha Legion. So, eh, you had a... They ran out of kind of interesting legions that they could do, because there's no way they're doing the Emperor's Children. No way they're doing the Emperor's Children. Um, <laughs> well, they could do the Emperor's Children, but this... This game would not get under a PG-18 rating if you're adding the Emperor's children. Um, <laughs> I guess they could have added the Thousand Sons, kind of. Uh, yeah, there's two others they could have done. Uh, the Thousand Sons would have been cool to see. The Iron Warriors would have also been kind of cool to see. Or, heck, just a full-on Night Lords. And not just a weird um, little subsect of the Night Lords. But anyway, let's cover the two I have the most information on, because funnily enough, Alpha Legion don't really have a famous non-Primarch. Um, they have a couple, but they either die in the heresy, or they kind of only show up once or twice, mainly thanks to the gimmick of the Alpha Legion, which is spies and stuff. Uh, and then Night Lords, who I don't know much on, but has possibly my coolest character in it, because he is cool. I'm going to cover him last, so you can kind of attempt to guess which is the coolest Night Lords, and I'd like to see people's guesses in the comments, although I have a funny idea most people would f might know who, who the coolest Night Lord is, as it's kind of obvious. You don't have many to pick from. But anyway, let's start with the most well-known Chaos character. Actually, do I want to start with the most well-known character or the most hated character? Hmm. Because one, one's very mean and very funny. The other one is, well, mean and very funny. Um, yeah, let's start with the most well-known character first. So, World Eaters. They're quite well known for their for them Primarch Angron. They are also well known for Angron's first lieutenant, a man, the, the man, the myth, the legend, Khan the Betrayer, 
Although, of course, he didn't get the Betrayer moniker until after the heresy. Um, he leads his own band of world eaters called the, uh, the Butcher's Horde. Got nothing to do with Angron. He kind of separated himself from the Primarch. Which is, funnily enough, not that uncommon after the heresy. A ton of chapters... A ton of legions did that, where they kind of separated and went away from their Primarchs. Um, funny enough, out of the list I've got here, the best example for that would be the Night Lords and the Alpha Legion. Mainly because their Primarchs died, but yeah, they kind of separated and started doing their own thing. Um, a ton of them ended up joining the Black Legion which was uh, the Sons of Horus after the Heresy because Horus died and most of them ended up killing each other. <laughs> of the Sons of Horus, not the other two legions. And then Horus did, oh, I'm the new war master. Everybody should join me because I'm so cool. Yes, it, anyway, that's got nothing to do with Khan the Betrayal. When it came to a, aggression and killing people, he was second only to Angron. That was the only other person who was more kill frenzy than Khan was. Although, don't mistake that for Khan being a brainless butcher. Khan was an incredibly powerful strategist. The problem was, once he got the smell of blood in his nose, he wouldn't stop. Much like a bulldog getting its jaws around like a well, what they were intended to hunt, cat, uh, bulls. That bulldog's not letting go until it's done its job. I just paused. Sorry. <laughs> so. Knowledge is power. I did well. Um. <laughs> and. We stand ready. Most of his fighting. Oh, yeah, I got my cat. Ah, uh, this was after they got fixed. Yeah, I got all my tactical squads stuck again. I figured out what's doing it. If you've got too many squads kind of merged, like, kind of balled up around an objective, and then you tell one of them to take said objective, or you group tell them to take the objective, they will then merge even more and then kind of get stuck. They're like those big balls of ants you get where they're kind of going in a giant circle because no one can figure out where the exit is. It ends up like that. Anyway, uh, Khan, when he is actively killing, can be found at the thickest of it with his with his favoured chain axe, which is Gore Child, which is a really cool name, by the way, for a chain axe, which, funny enough, was one of Angron's chain axes, as he had a pair, Gore Child and Gore... I think it was Gore Father... Yeah, I think it was Gore Father. Gore Father and Gore Child. Um, Angron gave up one of his axes when he became a demon Primarch, as Korn gave him a sword, which, by the... Uh, yes, my lord. By the rule the of cool, orders. swords are better than axes. Just a thing, awaits. especially when it's a big flaming demon sword compared command. to a chain axe. Um, Khan was one of the. I forget if he was one of the first or if he was. I think he was one of the first people to undergo um, Angron's. I'll, I'll call them operations. They were more mutilations of lobotomies and insertions of um, horrendous tech called the Butcher's Nails, which were put onto Angron by his... I wouldn't call it his home world, but by the world he was kind of dropped on. Uh, what the Butcher's Nails do, and their main ability is they remove all sensation of pleasure and pain and fear from the person that they're in unless you're and replace them with pain 
the only way to satiate this pain is if the person that's got these um, butcher's nails in is killing someone. That's the only way to satiate it is blood, basically. And with that, then they're given like a ton of pleasure and an ending of the pain to feel happy, which is actually quite a sad, a sad thing to think about. Um, now, the interesting thing about Khan is that he did die during the heresy. Which you may be now thinking, but he's got a model in 40k. He shows up in a couple of prominent stories in 40k. How could he have died in the heresy? Well, here's the funny thing about Chaos. Chaos doesn't care about your pitiful mortal rules. Um, so, Cain died, or Khan died. But he lived. Um, he basically became the, well, he became an, em an embodiment of Corn. Corn kind of breathed his murderous mojo into the, the broken, the fractured wits. corpse of Khan Understood. and made him something more than a mere space marine. Which is uh, not really Holy true. He, he's Holy still Holy just Holy a space Holy marine. Holy. It's just Corn brought him back from the dead. Um. <laughs> The and then the ta- So, he survived the heresy only to proceed to, um, do a thing that- Also, this was a dumb thing. I should have brought more guys down here. As you may notice, literally everybody is now caught up in, uh, in a fight. And this isn't even the bit where the main, um, the main problems start up. And now the obliterators have shown up. Yeah, this entire attack wave gets destroyed. It's the main reason I never go back down to deal with the Defilers. They're not that big of a problem. And they have possibly the most annoying trap in the game. As I lose literally everything there. Now, back to, uh, back to Khan. Um, oh, how did he get the moniker The Betrayer? Well, that's a semi-interesting story. It, it's not as interesting as it as it sounds as you'd think. Oh, he did some, you know, maybe he turned back to back to a loyalist. Maybe he did this or that. No, basically on the planet of um, Scalifrax, he was fighting a. I forget who it was, but it was another traitor legion because the traitor legions don't get along. Um, and during this fight, he... It would get so cold on the planet that it would kill space marines. Which, you may or may not know, is stupid. That must have been stupidly cold. Because it's quite difficult to kill a space marine with the weather. But anyway, um... So... What does he do when he's unhappy with his men carrying away in their in their homes attempting to uh oh and here's the dumb thing of this level which is yeah the central base will just throw out massive attack waves um and basically for most of this level i have like seven of my vehicle cap on um vehicles whose entire goal is stop them from destroying the main base um, so, to tr in an attempt to get his men to actually, you know, fight, Khan does the one thing he thinks is a brilliant idea, which is he takes a heavy flamer and starts torching his own men's uh, barracks, like the homes they're hiding in and torching them alive. Uh, this angers his own guys, who attempt to kill him, who, which angers him even more, and so he then kind of runs into the enemy camp doing the same thing, just flaming everything down with a heavy flamer, and kind of ripping the enemy apart, proving that he is possibly the... <laughs> he is quite a strong um, champion of corn. 
not in incredibly a smart one when he gets blood in his uh, the smell of blood on his nose, but he does does do quite well. Um, <laughs> that's Khan. Khan for you. Uh, the second one I was talking about at the start, the one everybody hates, is Erebus of the Word Bearers. Now I forget if Erebus actually did have the mon. Basically, I forget who got the moniker of um, the first traitor. I think that was Erebus. Was the first traitor, but he was first chaplain of the Word Bearers during the Heresy. And the reason why I forget if because er even though he was the first to fall to chaos. I'm assuming he is the first traitor, but I, I can't remember if that is actually his moniker or if that's Lorgar's moniker. I think it's Erebus's moniker. I can never I can never remember. Also, the main reason why those it's so annoying the constant attack waves is because the Chaos Space Marine squads are fully kitted out with um with aspiring champions. Aspiring champions are way stronger than a Space Marine cap, uh, Space Marine Sergeant. Also, yeah, you have uh, this massive attack wave where you get to kind of see what the weird purple thing does, which is uh, instantly heals all damage the Chaos squads take. If they take any damage, they immediately get healed. It's why it's annoying. Anyway, Erebus, he was the first to fall to Chaos. He then proceeded to convince Lorgar to fall to Chaos, who then, through Lorgar's help and his own planning, then went on to persuade Horus to fall to Chaos, starting the entirety of the Horus Heresy. <laughs> um, this was alongside another um, member of the of the Word Bearers called Cor Corferion. Uh, he then proceeded to mastermind the Isfam Free Massacres, which were where the um, Traitor Legions sent down their loyalist factions to a planet and then DNA bombed it to hell and back in an attempt to purge the loyalist sides of their legions. This kind of worked. More loyalists escaped than they probably intended. Um, but still, it it worked, even though worked is a really big o overstatement, be it that it did basically turn some of the legions... Uh, it basically killed a ton of the legion soldiers, making them kind of pointless in the grand scheme of things. Like, they ended up not being that useful, which, funnily enough, I think think is the biggest problem that the Alpha Legion had, as the Alpha Legion had a severe... Well, they didn't lose tons of people in the Isfam Free Massacres, but they, they lost quite a lot of people. Um, he, then, he then orchestrated the whole Kalf campaign, where the Word Bearers basically attempted to slaughter the Ultramarines before they could reinforce terror. And he created the Ruin Storm that separated most, if not all, the Loyalist um, legions from themselves, and attempted to <laughs> attempted to drive, basically create the Great Rift that is now in 40k in the Horus Heresy era. Some would say he kind of succeeded, kind of didn't, but still. Also, yeah, I lose all of this attack wave as well. I swear these uh, <laughs> these freaking strongholds are far too well uh, well tuned up. Um, oh, an interesting link between him and Khan is that Khan nearly killed Erebus, and by nearly, I mean it came as close as any other Imperial faction ever has to killing him in the, um, all down to the fact that Erebus kind of killed his friend, and 
Khan being, you know, being that he actually liked his friend, decided he would try to kill Erebus. And yeah, came surprisingly close, actually. Uh, didn't actually work, which is sad. Um, he would, even during the end of the heresy, he would proceed to claim to be the person who orchestrated the entire heresy, which I guess on a technical point is true. He did kind of orchestrate, he did kind of plan the parts that ended up causing the heresy, but he didn't plan it all, so he's kind of no, sir, lying, exp like, making himself commands. seem bigger than he actually was. I follow your commands. Um, Taking even the fun rule. funniest part of Erebus is... Space Marines, steer clear of no, the central sir, base until we've Emperor taken out that chaos field. Even though he, um, <laughs> prefers to think himself as this mastermind of the Horus Heresy, uh, he did end up getting banished by both his own chapter map, uh, his own Primarch, and Horus. Like, both of them ordered him to be killed on sight if he ever showed his face again. <laughs> kind of showing the fact that even amongst traitors, he was not liked. <laughs> they all kind of hated him. It's just funny to think of uh, this guy going, yes, I orchestrated everything. Why are you trying to kill me? <laughs> but that's, that's Erebus for you. Um, funnily enough, after the heresy, um, the word bearers operate off of this thing called the Black Council, which is basically every, it's basically the people that are in charge of what's left of the Legion. Um, Erebus is now within the Eye of Terror, fighting for control over that. Um, like, trying to get as much power as he can out of the Black Council and control of of his old legion as he can, which is funny, as I mentioned, he was banished by Lorgar, but, I mean, Lorgar's kind of indisposed at the moment, as he, as his chat, as his Primarch is kind of on the run from Corvus Corax, but that's a different story. Um... Then there's the Alpha Legion, who has, as I've mentioned, they don't really have a singular famous lieutenant. Not really. They have a couple of famous lieutenants. Oh, here's the bit where I... Basically, yeah, I just end up having, like, five um, Firestorm Dreadnoughts guarding the base at all times. I probably could have done a better better job of it, but I just decided this is probably for the best. Anyway, so, um, the Alpha Legion assisted in the Isfam 5 massacres, there was a bunch of other legions that did too, the problem is that once you're, if you're dealing with the Horus Heresy stuff, um, you realise a ton of it's not super important, like, the Alpha Legion had a ton of really small skirmishes. Emphasis on the word small. Um, they kind of were all over the place, but didn't do a ton of stuff that was important in the grand scheme of things. Well, so, the next thing on my list. Um, oh, so, the main thing that they did, their main port call, as it were, was the fact that they um, were the main guys who basically tr attempted to kill Raven Guard in every sense of the. So, they assisted in a ton of Raven Guard deaths on Isfam 5. They then snuck into the Raven Guard's um, homeworld of deliverance in the disguise of dead Raven Guard members. Which is already. already creepy. Um. <laughs> And stop the Raven Guard from producing new Space Marines to replace the ones that died in Isfarm 4. Or 5, sorry. Um, they, they did this by two prongs. 
the it's Emperor gave Corvus Corax, the guy in charge of the Raven Guard, he gave a pure sample of Gene Seed to create a new legion of Space Marines out. Well, not a new legion, but replace his Space Marines with. The Alpha Legion, knowing this and detecting this, decided, no, we're going to steal that and corrupt it so that all you can create are hideous hideous mutants who aren't fit to bear your name and then we're going to use it to make our legion better. Um, the second prong was to make the main world that as deliverance was the moon around a bigger planet called Caravan. I think it was Caravar or something like that. I can never remember them because it's it's not the it's not the Raven Guard's homeworld. The Raven Guard's homeworld is the moon, not the uh, planet it's orbiting. Um, so anyway, they got the people of that planet to rebel against the Raven Guard. It works, kind of. Um, soon after the Alpha Legion uh, corrupted and stole the Gene Seed, their deception on the main on the main world was detected and killed and all, most if not all of the Alpha Legion conspirators were eliminated during that. Now, the Alpha Legion, having basically lost the entire entire debacle, was forced to give Fabius Bile, um, the Emperor's children's main apothecary, uh, all the information they had stolen and the pure, samples of the pure gene seed the Emperor had given at uh, Corpus Corax. The Alpha Legion, being used to, you know, spies and spycraft, said, sure, here you go, and gave Fabius a useless disc that had giant holes missing in the data that it had. You know, because they didn't exactly like him. So yeah, that was that was fun. Um, <laughs> uh, oh, and then there's a weird gimmick with the Alpha Legion that I need to talk about, which is that the Alpha Legion pre-heresy had this thing where they would lay in double agents, so people who would appear traitor or would appear to be working alongside the people on the planet, like the Chaos Lords who controlled planets, or, you know, whoever was in, not really Chaos Lords, but whoever was in charge of the planet before joining the Empire, or the Imperium of Man, and would then have, um, then would immediately switch sides and begin helping, helping the Imperium of Man. So this main, the main gimmick that's followed the Alpha Legion is the fact that they're double agents. They are they are still loyal to the Imperium. And there is weird evidence to back it up. The main one I found in, in like my hour, half hour of research was that the Alpha Legion blew up a jamming site that was ensuring that the um, White Scars didn't know that the Horus Heresy was happening. Which kind of means that the White Scars only knew of the Horus Heresy because the Alpha Legion helped them. Now it's debatable what you want to call help. It's probably more they they did spring some weird story about how the site was was leaking information and they were doing it in an attempt to um. Uh, to stop said information from leaking, that's debatable. But still, it's kind of interesting to think about. Um, although, even if they were, uh, <laughs> even if they were loyalists, it's difficult to s it's difficult to speculate which parts were loyalists. As fine enough. They're called the Hydra. They had two Primarchs. Um, it was two indiv. I, I forget if they were always two individuals or if it was like the warp split them when it took took them. But that's uh, difficult to. That takes a while to get into. But they were called Alpharion and Omegon. Um, 
funnily enough, they were found first and last. So the first Primarch found was Altharion. Last one found was Omegon. Now, the interesting thing about them is that they won their twins, so they constantly swap their names and faces. And not not literally, but, they, but you know what I mean with twins. Um, now, whoever was pretending to be Altharion, and this doesn't... This only matters if you believe the idea that only one of them was truly a traitor. And I kind of fall into that camp that only one of them was truly a traitor, and I think it was Omega. I, I honestly don't think Altharion was a traitor, or at least not a, not a true traitor. Not like his brother. Mainly because the weird kind of underhand double act tactics kind of stopped after Pluto, which is where Rogel Dawn killed Altharion. The actual Altharion. Um, it is also debated which one of them died at Pluto, but I do believe it was it was actually Altharion that died at Pluto. Not um not, uh, Omega. I don't have any evidence to back that up. But I just kind of like the idea. Um, funnily enough, uh, uh, for the glory of the oh, I need the break there. Uh, funnily enough, <laughs> because they lost their chapter master before the Siege of Terror began, and because they kind of lost a lot of troops in the Isfahan Free thingy, and they kind of ended up losing a ton of their troops in other events, they didn't join the actual siege. They kind of did delaying tactics and stopping people from joining the siege, which did work, but it, you know, they just weren't involved in most of the big fights to do with the siege. Uh, and funny enough, a little bit after the heresy, his twin would then would then die shortly after in a uh, in another fight against someone. Funny enough, uh, I was getting near the end of my research time, so I, <laughs> I didn't really look into that much. Although, that again is believed. Was it uh, was it Omegon pretending to be Alpharius? Was it some of his own troops, which the Alpha Legion had a big thing of um, their own Space Marines looking like their Primarchs? Now, yes, this was in this was true for other chapters as well as the entire reason why Abaddon is Warmaster, <laughs> kind of, it's not the entire reason, but it's a pretty decent reason why he's the Warmaster, is because he looks a lot like Horus. Now yes, that isn't the entire reason, it's just a reason that helps a lot, is the fact that, yeah, no, he looks like his father. We must fall back. Oh, and you're going to see my HQ slaughter this demon prince. I think that's thanks to his uh, demon hammer. I don't know if it actually does deal extra damage to demons, but he does do a lot of damage. Once I get him to combat. There he is. I am ready. There we go. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, that's the Alpha Legion in its annoyingly uh, <laughs> no HQs to talk about history. Then we have, and there's the Demon Prince dead. Um, and then we have my favourite character who is part of possibly my most hated Legion, which is the Night Lords. Who's my favourite character? Well, of course, it is ja Jago Savatarion, or Sevatar. Or to give him his proper titles, the, um... 
the condemned or the Prince of Crows uh, who was the first captain of the Atramentar, who was the Alpha Legion's first company, who, funnily enough, when being Terminator, Sevatar, not much of a fan of um, Terminator armor, funnily enough, um, didn't, didn't really wear it. Uh, and was a was a extremely repressed psyker. Well, okay, not extremely repressed, but repressed enough that it became a problem later down the line. Um, he who stands with me shall be my. <laughs> his his biggest claim to fame pre heresy. Well, not his biggest claim to fame, but the most interesting one was that he. Won a fight with Sigismund. Technically. Now, he didn't win it fair, as he was. <laughs> the Night Lords never really fought fair. They kind of. Well, they didn't. They always kind of cheated. But the main thing he did in this fight was that he. Um, so. Sigismund and Se Se Sevatar got into a fairly, fairly pitched fight that lasted 30 hours. 30 long hours of the two trying to kill each other outright. It was a, well, it's not a duel to the death, but it was a duel to, I think it was a duel to like the first blood, which is a semi-dumb gimmick in duels, but it basically means the first person to cut the other one and draw blood. Or something like that. I'm assuming that's what the fight was too. Um, the description of the fight itself was kind of just the footnotes. But anyway, how he won slash cheated was he headbutted Sevatar in the face, um, breaking. Oh no, he yeah, Sevatar headbutted Sigismund in the face, breaking. Technically, the fight was that he was then disqualified, and Sigismund didn't win. Sevatar didn't lose, but he didn't win either. It was a draw. But it did end Sigismund's 100-year victory streak. Up until that point, he had never lost a fight. Technically, he didn't lose this fight either, but he didn't win it, so in the weird scheme of things, it is put as a, vi as a loss. Basically, depending on how you look at it, uh, draws and disqualifications are either everybody loses or everybody wins. It's there's kind of like no in between. Anyway, yeah, this is these are the guys I end up defending the camp with, as they are surprisingly good at it. Uh, we are no, we're no, we're, we're nowhere near the end here. But anyway, oh. And during the heresy, uh, Sevatar would become disconnected from his Primarch and the other legions, mainly due to the fact they weren't a great fan of demons. Um, a great scene is after the events of the Istvan Four Massacre, which he was a part of, a member of the Word Bearers, a link back to another one of the uh, one of the legions, um who was a Gal Vorbach, which was basically the Emperor's word bearers had the, had the Gal Vorbach, which were guys who had allowed demons to warp them and change them, basically turning them into like what would later go on to be called the Possessed, is the basic, basic gist of it, of what a Gal Vorbach is. I, I think they're a bit more complicated than that. But the basic they they're the things that would become the possessed um but anyway in this scene a gal Vorbach walks up to him to congratulate them on the massacre they've committed and Sevatar takes his helmet off rather calmly and spits in the guy's face oh no actually no spits on the ground in front of the guy but still it's still dishonoring the guy um <laughs> Now, I don't fully know why the Night Lord's not a fan of demons, and to be honest, it could be to just be Sevatar, for all I know, um, as other Night Lord depictions, I don't s well, they don't use that many demons, they're not that, 
they don't show that much disdain towards them. It's mainly just they're kind of like chaos undivided kind of feel to them. It's possible the Night Lords don't like demons. It's just I've never, I've never gotten that feeling from them. They have an active disdain of demons. But anyway, the interesting thing about Sevatar is the fact that during an event to um, kind of see if the aim, the to delay the angels of um, or the dark angels, they ended up having a parlay with Lionel Johnson, where the um, the lion ended up meeting with a bunch of their. Uh, so the Primarchs met with two of their with two of their side guys, their left and right hand, as to say. So the Night Lord's Primarch, Corvus Cor, not Corvus Corax. I can't combat Kurs. It, it, it's annoyingly close. Uh, he brought his his two rights or his two hands, one of which was Sevatar. Lionel Johnson did the same. Funnily enough, the whole thing turned out to be a ploy by the by the Dark Angels, weirdly, as a ploy to try and basically kill the entirety of the Night Lords, almost succeeded, funnily enough, did actually a really good job of uh, destroying a ton of the Night Lords' upper command. The main thing that happened was uh, Conrad Kurz was mortally wounded and nearly died he did survive that encounter and then proceeded to survive the heresy for a little bit. But, um... And Sevatar technically survived that encounter, ended up getting captured by the Dark Angels and captured on their ship, on their main capital ship, where he ended up kind of forming a relationship a relationship with a um, with an astropath girl aboard the, aboard the ship who was who the two of them would debate well kind of debate the whole heresy what was going on why he did what he did now an interesting thing at that meeting that is explained later in with the girl is what For the, um, what, well, it's explained during the meeting, the road to but it's brought up, it's here. brought up later, which is, Sevatar, at that meeting, his armor's changed, as usually his armor was just the common blue of the, uh, Night Lord, but during that meeting, his armor had changed so that his forearms and, uh, and hands were painted blood red, like viscera red. So against the dark blue it was quite obvious that they were, you know, a different colour. And when asked what that means, Sevatar replies basically with that it's a symbol from his homeworld of traitors and fools. Like that's the colours that they get. And it ends up with this interesting this interesting bit basically where it's difficult to determine why Sevatar got them. Because, yes, calling him a traitor makes sense. I mean, the guy's part of a traitor legion. Of course, calling, marking him as a traitor kind of makes sense, but the problem is that the sigils are meant to be marking him as a traitor to his people, not to the Imperium. Because he never betrayed, well, he seemingly never betrayed his own people. So is it meant to be marking Sevatar as a fool? As Sevatar was loyal to Conrad, basically to the end. Like even, um, even within like his, in when he was fighting aboard the Dark Angel ship. He was given many an opportunity to escape himself, but he stayed in an attempt to try and save Sevatar. Even in the end, as that was the thing that got him captured, was trying to save his Primarch. 
so it's a kind of weird thing in that it's never really explained why he adopted the markings or what they're meant to represent to him as an individual. We just know what they represent to his chapter and what they're meant to illustrate, but we don't know we don't know the context of it. And while he is aboard talking to her, he kind of becomes a loyalist? Kind of, or at least he begins to question Horus and what they're doing as traitors and who they're fighting for, because the Horus heresy spawned from the entire idea that the Emperor wanted to basically create humanity, have this golden age of humanity and basically go away from gods and religions and only and devote humanity entirely to science. Horus, through the help of Erebus, um, was revealed revealed the great lie that there are gods out there, there are other powers out there, more powerful than even the Emperor, debatably. Oh, and his. Come on, do your speech, because this is the only one that really is important. Also, yeah, I kind of just spam heavy bolters at this point. <laughs> it kind of works. But anyway. Um, and he begins to question... Well, what's the point of... If we were meant to be fighting for a better humanity, what's the point of fighting for Horus when really all he's trying to do is kill everybody? And so... What ends up happening is Sevatar escapes his cell and everybody thinks that, oh, he's trying to get away, he's trying to help. No, what he ends up doing is, during his talks with this little astropath girl, it, um, uh, the astropath's mentor finds out and because, you know, Sevatar is a traitor, Sevatar is, is a heretic, he beats her viciously to the point of, I think, breaking her jaw? Um, and nearly killing the girl. This gets back to Sevatar, who then breaks out of his cell in a Dark Angel's, um, in the Dark Angel's capital ship, one of the most well-reinforced ships in the entire system, the probably even the second hardest to break wins. out next to the phalanx, and then proceeds to hunt the guy in charge who did it, and then brutally kills the guy in the only way he knows how as a Night Lord, which kind of comes off as kind of Batman-esque, you know, I am the Night Vengeance kind of thing for wronging, wronging someone he debatably cared for. It's difficult to say that he ha had a friendship in her because it's, I mean, it's Sevatar. He's not exactly, he's not sunshine and rain, he's not a sunshine and rainbows kind of guy. He's kind of the tear your eyeballs out and then let you die slow kind of guy. What would you have me do? So it's difficult to know what was going through his head, but it does come off as a... He actually was hurt by hearing that by talking to him she was caused pain and so goes out of his way to get vengeance. Which, funnily enough, was the entire thing that Sevatar... Well, not Sevatar... But what Conrad Kurz started out as on Nistromo, he started out as a Batman-esque guy seeking vengeance. The other interesting thing about Sevatar, and maybe the most interesting thing, is the fact that he may or may not be dead. Um, funnily enough, the story ends with Sevatar basically being recaptured. Um, from what I can remember of the story, he doesn't 
despite being recaptured after killing um, the head astropath, he kind of just kills him and then waits around for the Dark Angels to find him again and then put him back in a I cell. The, enemy. Um, they are the Dark Angels then proceed to head on towards Terra to With attempt to... And honor. In the eyes of the blood god, Korn, who is our None master. can stand we before us. We fight for chaos! Slay the enemy! Slay! <laughs> and anyway, so yeah, the last we hear of Sevatar is him on the capital ship going back to Terra. With courage and honor. The problem is at no point do we hear that Sevatar died. We don't hear that he got executed. The most we get is just he was a traitor heading back to Terra. Now there's debates about if he was executed. Uh, in a later book, one of the Night Lords say he died, but it's debatable if he's telling the truth. Mainly down to the fact of how would the Night Lords know? The last time they saw Sevatar, he was captured alive by the Dark Angels, and then he completely disappeared. Now, yes. That is actually pretty good evidence that he did die, as it's quite difficult for a space marine to just completely disappear. But it is not unknown of. Uh, the main point, the main evidence I have for a character completely disappearing, it's funny enough Cypher, as no one knows who he is. They only know he's a space marine and that he's a dark angel space marine. I don't even know if the Dark Angels have any idea who Sevatar, not Sevatar, who Cypher is. So it is possible for Space Marines, even though they are incredibly important, to just completely vanish. Now, another point to bring up is the fact that, um, another fan theory to bring up is that Sevatar was a very powerful repressed psyker in the last moments of that fight I was talking about, uh, the meeting with the Dark Angels that got him captured, he was attempting to use his psychic powers to find his Primarch to save him before said powers overtook him and he passed out. The common idea is that he could have then been recruited into the Grey Knights, who Every one of them is a very powerful Psyker, and it makes sense if Sevatar was kind of turning from his own his own faction that he would attempt to um, help the Imperium. The Grey Knights themselves are a completely unknown factor, like no one apart from the Grey Knights and the, Impi and the Inquisition actually know what's going on within the Grey Knights. Like, no one else is told, no one else is allowed to know. This ends up be, being bad most of the time as the Grey Knights kind of end up doing really weird stuff. But anyway, back to my, uh, back to my other, my main point. Faith is our scene. Uh, is like a fortress um, with its gates it, but yeah, it's just never explained where he ends up, and I've, I've just always liked the theory he's out there somewhere because he was a—he's a very interesting character. Um, funnily enough, talking about the Inquisition, the the other fan theory is that he just ended up in some Inquisitor's retinue as Inquisitors. One, do end up with Space Marines in their retinues every now and again, um, generally due to uh, requesting the Space Marines and Inquisitors being the only people who can technically boss Space Marines around, other than their own Chapter Masters. Then again, it's also true that the Chapter Master can, rep can, over can reprimand those, not reprimand, but I forget the technical term for it. He can overturn those orders. So it is possible Sevatar just ended up in control, being controlled by some Inquisitor somewhere. 
uh, there's other things that could have happened, but it's just an interesting thing to think about. And also, he is my favourite character of the Horus Heresy, because he actually has an arc. <laughs> Most of them don't. <laughs> they just are evil from the beginning, stay evil, and get more evil. Looking at you, Erebus. Anyway, let's watch this cutscene. No! We cannot lose! We cannot die! How can we? Without our devotion! Without our sacrifice! Oh, the horrid blossom of chaos will wither! We'll die! world is slipping from our grasp. Could have kept the hammer. Also, is it me or does he actually sound scared? That is a weird thing in a space marine to hear. Actual fear. Yep, just over an hour and a half, or nearly over. It is uh. the wish of every space marine to seek revenge for the bloody wars of the Horus Heresy. When the loyal chapters battled the heretical traitors and earned themselves a place in the history of the Imperium, Force Commander Indrik Boreal knew well the fervor with which his men would fight and strove to perfect his battlefield tactics so he could grant them the victory and glory which was, he felt, their due. Boreal's company of blood ravens acquitted themselves more than admirably against the Alpha Legion. Although they waded through miles of corrupted land into the very heart of the warp storm, where maddened cultists danced and chanted, and phantasmal horrors wafted through the air. Not a single soldier swerved from his faith or duty. The Blood Ravens were proud soldiers that day, in the eyes of their commander, their order, and the entire Imperium. On that day, history was made, and they knew glory. Anyway, I've been Inquisitor, this has been Dawn of War Soulstorm, and I'll see you in the next one as I ended this one apparently way too freaking early. Uh, <laughs> bye!